I'm going to basically talk about Ben Franklin as a backdrop and come back to him at the uh, end as a way of thinking about how we ought to approach the question of religion in the public square, how we ought to approach the question of sacred places serving civic purposes, how we ought to approach the question of whether and how best to have, uh, in particular, local community serving grassroots religious organizations partner with government, partner with each other in ecumenical, interfaith, religious, secular uh, ways that uh, end up producing measurable civic, civic benefits, especially uh, for low-income children, youth, and families in urban areas. Professor uh, Friedman, uh, after he contacted me this latest time about coming out here, and I'm so glad to, to finally be able uh, to make it. Um, but I looked uh, back at my Waldowski shelf, and I you know, uh, went through some of the materials there. And then I actually, I don't know, I must have been my second year at Harvard, Professor Waldowski wrote uh, an article for the New York Times. It was a review essay in 1982. And this was you know, yellow inside one of, the, one of the books. And let me just begin uh, this evening by quoting what Professor Waldowski said in this review essay for the New York Times. Again, this is 1982. It began as follows. Every government needs its critics. Its inconsistencies and hypocrisies need to be exposed. When criticism does its work, supporters of a particular president and political party know more about where they have fallen down. Opponents know more about whether their alternatives are likely to prove preferable. And the undecided learn more about the differences between what is and what might be." Close quote. Well, in my view, the differences between what is and what might be with respect to religion, politics, and community-serving programs are many and profound. President Bush, President George W. Bush, has repeatedly uh, talked about faith-based organizations, community-serving religious groups, supporting these with, pu with public dollars, public authority, private support as well. He has repeatedly called it the single most significant domestic initiative of his presidency, his signature initiative. And the thing I want to begin with is to make very clear is that the president's commitment here has been and continues to be supported by many, many top Democrats, including people who you might think of as strange bedfellows on this issue. Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton uh, last year in Boston gave a speech that wasn't widely covered. But in that speech, Senator Clinton said, and I quote her here, nobody is more likely to serve the needy than someone who sees God at work. We should not have a false debate about the role of faith-based institutions we need to just do it and provide the support that is needed on an ongoing basis, close quote. Well, I agree with that. But a decade after the first faith-friendly federal laws went on the books, which as I'll talk about in a little bit, was in 1996 with the first so-called charitable choice laws, and a half decade into the Bush faith-based initiative, Washington has yet to provide, in Senator Clinton's phrase, the support that is needed on an ongoing basis. And I guess the question for me this evening I'd like to uh, lay out some answers to for you is how best to change that? Well, Ben Franklin, and here, here he comes, John. I'm sorry, but here he is. Uh, I would suggest to you Ben Franklin might be our surest civic guide here. Certainly, I think Franklin is a kindred civic spirit of President Bush and Senator Clinton on this issue. In 1749, Franklin founded the Academy of Philadelphia, which later on became the non-sectarian University of Pennsylvania. It is true, he did like Philly taverns on Saturday nights more than Philly churches on Sunday mornings. That's absolutely true. That's why we like him. In fact, he once claimed that beer was proof of God's existence uh, and proof also that God loves us. Uh, so he was very wise uh, indeed. It's not clear to me, at least I've you know, done my uh, dutiful Franklin biography reading. There are a lot of Franklin biographies, it turns out, in fact, more than I cared to read. Uh, and I'm pretty well convinced that in the end, or at least I'm, it's not clear to me whether Ben Franklin himself believed, even provisionally, uh, in any spiritual concept or reality, Christian or other. Uh, there are different views on that, but I'm not actually sure Franklin was a believer. But what is crystal clear, no matter which Franklin uh, you read, or which Franklin is profiled, 
What is crystal clear is what Ben believed regarding religion in the American Civic Square. Uh, Walter Isaacson, who I think is maybe the best single volume biographer of Franklin at this point, aptly describes Franklin as, Franklin as an apostle of tolerance who contributed to the building funds of each and every sect in Philadelphia and opposed religious oaths and tests both in the Pennsylvania and in the federal constitutions. Ben's religious beliefs were driven by pragmatism. Or as Franklin himself put it, under certain conditions, religion can, quote, serve as a powerful regulator of our actions, give us peace and tranquility in our minds, and render us benevolent, useful, and beneficial to others. The month before he died, on, on, really on his deathbed, Franklin penned a letter to Reverend Ezra Stiles, uh, then the president of Yale University, who was basically saying, hey, Ben, time's a, a wasting. You need to come to Jesus now. And I wish I could quote the whole text of Franklin's letter, because uh, to write such a letter at all, let alone on one's deathbed, uh, was really a sort of a, a small miracle in itself. But in that letter back to Stiles, Franklin opines that if indeed there is one God, uh, per the Judeo-Christian tradition, then, and I quote Franklin again here, then the most acceptable service we render to him is doing good to his other children, close quote. To pour forth benefits for the common good is divine. That is the motto of the Library Company of Philadelphia, which Franklin also founded. Uh, he did that in 1731. To pour forth benefits for the common good is divine. There's a Latin to that, but I wasn't that kind of an altar boy. I was an altar boy, but I was a post-Vatican II altar boy, so I don't know my Latin. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. What I want to suggest to you this evening is that Franklin's pragmatic, pluralistic, yet faith-friendly understanding of religion in the public square is actually reflected, maybe not quite mirrored, but reflected today in mass public opinion, in Supreme Court doctrine, in empirical social science research, in best practices public administration, and, I think, in ready-to-resurrect bipartisan elite sentiment, all of these things, I think, endorse Franklin's faith-friendly, pragmatic, pluralistic vision of religion, politics, and community-serving programs. Back for a moment to my friend Senator Clinton, who is a Methodist and who has often spoken about God in the public square. This is not just a run-up to 2008, as is being alleged. If you go back and look at her career, she's often spoken about how religious precepts have infused and informed uh, her policy views. And during the Clinton-Gore administration, Senator Clinton, then First Lady Clinton, supported several so-called charitable choice laws that, as I, again I will describe in a, a bit more detail in, in a little later on, were intended in part to enable grassroots religious organizations to participate in the federal grant-making process on the same basis that all other nonprofit organizations do, including large national religious nonprofits. Not to favor them, not to even particularly empower them, but to give them equal treatment, to enable them to participate just as all other nonprofit organizations, including large national religious organizations, have long participated in that process. And during the 2000 presidential campaign, uh, as John uh, uh, intimated, uh, I know for a fact that both Gore and Bush uh, had similar views on the issue because I wrote parts of speeches <laughs> for both of them. One had the armies of civil society, the other had paramedics of civil society. They're the same people. Um, and uh, Gore actually gave the first faith-based speech. People don't remember that. It was in May uh, of 1999 in Atlanta, speaking at a Salvation Army uh, re drug Rehabilitation Center. Uh, the Vice President spoke with uh, really unusual passion. Or any passion for him was considered unusual, but in any case, it was a good speech. Um, and uh, he basically uh, laid out an argument that a few months later, in July of 99, uh, Governor Bush uh, pretty much echoed. Um, in that speech that Bush gave, his, his also his maiden campaign speech, it was called The Duty of Hope, standing before uh, inner city clergy in Indianapolis, he talked mainly about helping the poor in this faith -based, with this faith-based rubric. Let me just, just quote a bit, just a bit of that speech. In every instance where my administration sees a responsibility to help people, we will look first to faith-based organizations, charities, and community groups. 
Sometimes the armies of compassion uh, are outnumbered and outflanked and outgunned. It is not enough to call for volunteerism. Without more support, public and private, it's just asking them to make bricks without straw. We will keep a commitment to pluralism, not discriminating for or against Methodists or Mormons or Muslims or good people of no faith at all. Government cannot be replaced by charities, but it should welcome them as partners, not resent them as rivals, close quote. And that, was, that last line was a critical line. Government cannot be replaced by charities. The idea was not that government would step aside and we'd have this flourishing of civil institutions, especially little religious ones that were going to do the work of health and human services. No possibility of that. You'd have to be out of your mind to think there was any possibility of that. But could these organizations supplement? Could these organizations help to provide for the needs of people in neighborhoods that in many cases have been subjected to as much as 50 or more years of both public and private disinvestment? The idea was that government cannot be replaced by charities, but that these organizations can empower. And that was very much the same idea that Vice President Gore talked about, and it was a point of consensus during the 2000 campaign. The first of these so-called charitable choice laws was actually a provision of the 1996 Welfare Reform Bill. There was a second charitable choice provision that was added to the Community Services Block Grant Program, and then in 2000 there were two other uh, charitable choice provisions, one in the Substance Abuse Prevention uh, Treatment Block Grant and another in the Projects for Assistance and Transition for Homelessness Program. And essentially, you know, for these four different bills and their differences or four different provisions, charitable choice reflected or addressed what was a pretty basic flaw in public administration. And you know, it begins, the, to understand what that flaw was, you just need to begin with the fact that the federal government does most of what it does in domestic and social policy, not directly, but through state and local governments, through nonprofit organizations, and through for-profit groups, uh, what my colleague at Penn, Don Kettle, likes to call the government by proxy system. And for decades now, this government by proxy system, with respect to nonprofits, has favored large national nonprofits. And that's not a bad thing. Religious nonprofits, like Catholic Charities, Jewish Federations, Lutheran Social Services, Salvation Army, tens of billions of dollars have gone to these national religious organizations. And then secular groups, wonderful ones like Youth Build, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, these too have been a part of this government by proxy system. But local nonprofit organizations, the smaller, the grassroots, the inner, especially in the inner cities, these organizations have traditionally faced real barriers to their participation in this government by proxy system. And this has been true even when the grassroots religious groups supply the bulk of a given type of social service to their needy neighbors. It's been true even when they serve the youngest and the neediest and the most difficult to serve populations in their own communities without regard to religion. It's been true even when they've had long-standing working partnerships with public organizations or other secular nonprofits. It's been true even when they've been subjected to independent performance evaluations, which after decades and decades of funding these larger nonprofit organizations, I can count on my fingers and toes, and I am not a Vulcan, uh, you know, there are only 10 and 10 here, I can count on my, the number of actual independent impact studies or evaluations that have been done uh, of these organizations that have received grant funding year in, year out in the billions. And it's been true even when they have achieved or have declared a willingness to achieve 501c3 status. They are given last priority at best with respect to both funding and technical assistance or short shrift, uh, kick to the curb, discriminated against at worst, even when they're doing most of the work. There's a technical term for the way the system works. I don't have time to go into this evening. It's too technical. The technical term for the way the system works, it's a term of art in political science. It's called pimping. Large nonprofit organizations often work to get the money, get it year after year. They find networks of small indigenous groups, 
usually ones located where the people are, not on the metropolitan periphery, not in the, the commercial center, and the little groups get the crumbs and provide the services, and the big guys, you know, get the bigger bucks. That's not true for all. Let me just be clear. I'm not here to bash, even though it felt like when I was in the White House that some of the large nonprofits I was there to bash, the large nonprofit groups. I'm simply saying that has been a reality. Uh, and the little groups simply have become more vocal about that over the past 10 to 15 years. For instance, we know from studies, multi-city studies, studies that have been done in over 15 cities at this point, that say in the area of local criminal justice agencies, they have extensive partnerships with grassroots religious groups to deliver court mandated education, employment, uh, other services to minority youth who have gotten into serious trouble with the law. You know, if you're a kid in Philadelphia and my old neighborhood, I could run faster in those days, so it didn't happen to me, but it uh, happened to some of my friends. And you get picked up, you know, the judge will say, uh, let's see, what do we got? Second time him. Go to St. Gabriel's Hall, without even giving it a second thought. You couldn't have juvenile probation functioning in terms of court-mandated uh, services and so forth if it wasn't for the network of religious, generally smaller religious nonprofit organizations in city after city. Yet in 2001, the late last year for which we have reliable data, the U.S. Department of Justice awarded only one-third of one percent, point zero zero three percent of its discretionary grant funds to faith-based organizations and virtually nothing to minority-led youth outreach ministries. So the people who are on the streets, who are doing the work, who are out there day in, day out, they're getting no support or they're getting somebody's crumbs. That was part of the motivation uh, uh, for charitable choice and obviously part of the motivation uh, for me. By the same token, studies find that local faith-based groups supply a significant fraction of urban welfare to work services. And we could tell the same story about any one of over 200 discrete types of services that have been studied by my Penn colleague, Ram Kanan, and others, again, in multi-city multi, uh, uh, studies. Uh, what the welfare to work studies uh, basically find is that those who do get grants, when they get them, get on average much, much less than their secular counterparts, but they are denied funding at three times the rate when they do apply of their secular uh, counterparts. And as Steve Monsma, who really is, I think, the dean of political scientists, at least, who study religious nonprofits, uh, has remarked, these data tell us that a prima facie case can be made that discrimination is going on. Uh, well, yeah. Now, charitable choice laws, get back to that very quickly, simply acknowledge this possibility. They didn't say it's happening, and we've got to do something about it. They simply say, well, if it, if it is happening, let's just be sure that if an organization applies to government and it doesn't have a big professional staff and it doesn't have, you know, all of the bells and whistles, that we at least consider them on the merits, that we don't automatically put them in the out pile or not give them consideration because it says St. David's or whomever shall we serve ministry as opposed to, you know, Joe's Bar and Grill or, you know, something service incorporated. What, in effect, charitable choice laws were saying to federal, state, and local, but in particular, at that stage, federal agencies was, follow court doctrine. Follow court doctrine. Because the court doctrine, to switch now to that in this area, is centered on strict neutrality principles. What do I mean by that, very quickly? In 1952, Justice William O. Douglas uh, in Zorak v. Clausen uh, basically underlined the more or less strict or no-aid separation principles that had been articulated in the sort of landmark Everson case in 47, uh, where Justice Black, uh, we don't have half enough time to get into that, Justice Black declared essentially uh, the wall of separation uh, as part of the constitutional uh, principle here. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into that, but the important thing, the reason I cite Justice uh, Douglas here, uh, again, uh, who underlined uh, the principle uh, as established in Everson, is that he was very careful to add, and this is 52, just five years after the Everson decision, he's careful to add that, and I quote, the First Amendment does not say that in every and all respects there shall be a separation of church and state, close quote. And by 1971, uh, 
the court, you know, is figuring out a way to sort of deal with the reality and also deal with the actual constitutional history here. By 71, Chief Justice Warren Burger in Lemon versus Kurtzman comments that, and I quote, the line of separation far from being a wall is a blurred, indistinct, and variable barrier depending upon all the circumstances of a particular relationship, close quote. And what the Lemon test, as it comes to be called, does is it says essentially a particular relationship between government and religious activities or institutions is permissible, is constitutionally kosher, if it meets three neutrality principles. One, it has a secular or civic purpose. Two, its primary effect neither advances nor inhibits religion. And three, it does not foster an excessive entanglement between government and religion. Now, I co-author an American government textbook. It's hard to summarize <laughs> you know, court doctrine in this area in a way that is faithful to what the court is saying. But what I would suggest to you is that the post-Lemon court, since 1971, has been pretty faithful about trying to apply this Lemon test on a case-by-case -case basis. That may be the least popular opinion on the matter in the world. Uh, I guess it was a year ago in the fall I had the, the honor, the privilege to speak opposite, I wouldn't call it a debate, uh, Justice Scalia. Uh, at Princeton on this question. And um, it's interesting to see how you know, different people, including someone like a Supreme Court justice uh, himself or herself, thinks about this. In my view, just to summarize, to, to sort of illustrate for you, two recent cases which were widely reported, the one to be a pro-religion decision and the other an anti-religion decision, in my view, were both pro-neutrality decisions. The, um, Zellman versus Simmons-Harris case in 2002 and the Locke v. Davey case in 2004. Just very briefly, in Zellman, the court upheld a Cleveland program that gave low-income inner-city parents vouchers that they could use to send their children to non-public schools, including religious schools. And the Cleveland program, the court ruled, when they looked at its origins, its history, the fact that it was part of a state takeover, the fact that it was based on income, the fact that it was based on you know, ge geographically bounded, the court said this does not violate the Establishment Clause, period. In Locke, the court upholds Washington State's constitutional exclusion of a devotional theology degree from its otherwise inclusive state scholarship program. The Washington State program, the court says, does not violate the Free Exercise Clause. Again, Zellman was not, in my view, pro-religion, but pro-neutrality. Locke was not anti-religion, but pro-neutrality. Chief Justice Rehnquist in Locke noted that, and I just quote him here, some states draw a more stringent line in defining anti-establishment interests than the United States Constitution itself does. But federalism and states' rights precedents permit such differences. Besides, that a state would deal differently with religious education for the ministry than with education for other callings is not evidence of hostility toward religion for religious instruction is of a different ilk, close quote. Now, I know that statement upsets many people, especially some of my friends uh, who are evangelical Christian leaders, because so far as they're concerned, why is religion of a different ilk? Who said religion was of a different ilk? What about Marxism? What about secular humanism? What about you know, this ism and that ism? And my answer is, don't blame me, Blame Adams, blame Franklin, blame Madison, because they were very well aware of ideology. You know, 1787, 1789, French Revolution, <laughs> you know, they understood ideology. And they also understood Orthodox Christianity. Nobody had to lecture these guys about the Great Awakenings. Plus, they knew George Washington, right? Who was a pretty conventionally religious fellow, okay? They singled out religion. Nothing else. They did it for special protection and special scrutiny. Anytime government touches it, marked handle with care. So, these decisions, this line of case law, I think, is largely correct. I think the court has been largely consistent. And I think, therefore, charitable choice laws, the four I mentioned, are all constitutionally uh, in the clear because they were crafted to be. What do I mean by that? The 1996 charitable choice law had a black letter
prohibition against proselytizing with public funds. I will quote it. No funds provided directly to institutions or organizations to provide services and administer programs shall be expended for sectarian worship, instruction, or proselytization, period. Hence also its references to the employment practices provision of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Together with subsequent federal laws and statutes, the ministerial exemption, so-called, in the Civil Rights Act of 64, gives religious organizations functioning as tax-exempt houses of worship an unqualified right to take religion into account. You don't have to interview priests for a rabbi position or vice versa, but also gives them a limited right, limited right, ministerial to take religion into account with respect to their operating in a capacity as a community-serving uh, nonprofit organization. Majority public opinion strongly supports this balanced approach. So lining up court doctrine, lining up public administration, charitable choice, majority opinion is right there. The Pew Forum on Religion, many, many other surveys over the past six, seven years, find about three quarters of citizens, and it really doesn't vary much according to party affiliation, about three quarters of citizens agreeing that federal social service program beneficiaries should have a variety of options, including religious organizations, and also opining things like they believe faith-motivated you know, volunteers are probably more caring and compassionate uh, than other providers. Ah, but three quarters also oppose public funding, oppose public funding for religious programs that, quote, only hire people of the same faith, close quote, or require beneficiaries, quote, to take part in religious practices, close quote. So public opinion is lined up with neutrality doctrine, lined up with charitable choice. And what we know empirically from a social science standpoint, I submit to you, about faith-based organizations, about religious community-serving organizations, is of a piece with majority opinion and also completely at peace with court doctrine. Let me just give you a couple quick for instances here without boring you to death. Uh, I believe in social science. I believe it is the elaborate demonstration of the obvious by methods that are obscure. Uh, I believe in it. Um, uh, and we need more of it. Uh, but uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Bob Putnam at Harvard, Robert Putnam, of course, began uh, his argument about uh, seeing data indicating that fewer and fewer Americans were joining associations and churches and other groups that promote civic trust and cooperation. And he impaneled, uh, after he got involved in some academic back and forth about whether uh, these early data and the renderings thereof were correct, he impaneled a group of, uh, a very big and diverse group of, of uh, folks, including some academics, including yours truly, uh, to study sort of the evidence and suggest how best to replenish the nation's so-called social capital. And uh, everything said and done, the data revealed that faith-based organizations supplied myriad social services uh, to their communities and were, in fact, major civic seedbeds of volunteering and philanthropy. Let me just quote to you the Putnam Group's 2001 uh, report, the conclusion in, in its 2001 uh, report called Better Together. I think it's still up there on the Kennedy School website. Uh, quote, houses of worship build and sustain more social capital and social capital of more varied forms than any other type of institution in America. Churches, synagogues, mosques, and other houses of worship provide a vibrant institutional base for civic good works and a training ground for civic entrepreneurs. Roughly speaking, nearly half of America's stock of social capital is religious or religiously affiliated, whether measured by association memberships, philanthropy, or volunteering, close quote. Um, I'm happy to say that Bob Putnam is at work on a big, thick book on religion, the one that I probably should have written five years ago, but don't have the, there's a good German word for it, right? Stick to itness somewhere uh, to do. What is it? That's exactly what I should have, but I don't. Some of that. But uh, he's coming out with this book, and I'm sure it's going to be terrific and you know, extend that analysis. Social capital as spiritual capital. So I look for that. But I want to just add one wrinkle here, which is important for my purposes this evening and for the argument uh, and the discussion I think um, it's worth having with respect to the policy, uh, most policy relevant portions of this. Community serving faith based organizations, wonderful as they are as social capital generators and so forth, vary 
right? I mean, they're not all of a piece. You know, I say faith-based, what, what does that mean? I mean, they vary according to whether they have explicitly religious mission statements, or whether they use religious references in the work they do, whether they expect beneficiaries to participate in religious activities, whether they employ religious criteria in staffing decisions, and on and on. So the continuum, the work that I've done over the past, on and off over the past decade, the continuum runs from what I call faith-based all the way down to what I call faith-saturated, okay? And empirically speaking, the good news, I think, is threefold. First, the vast majority of urban community-serving religious groups cluster, are strongly clustered at the faith-based faith end, not the faith-saturated end of this continuum. Second, volunteer mobilization, not spiritual transformation, is faith-based organizations' most well-documented civic comparative advantage. And third, and not least in terms that Bob uh, fancies, if you look at these groups and ask what kind of social capital do they produce, bonding social capital in group, for the group, for members only, or bridging social capital, reaching beyond the group to serve non-members, predominantly these organizations represent bridging, not bonding social capital, or they convert, if you will, bonding social capital into bridging social capital by running programs that serve people without regard to religion. Just to summarize writ large, most urban faith-based organizations deliver services using volunteers only. They have few, if any, paid service delivery staff. Only a very tiny fraction receive any public funds whatsoever. They don't make entering their buildings, receiving their services, participating in their programs in any way contingent upon some present or future profession of faith or other religious commitment or practice. They don't hire only co-religionists, and they don't oppose working in partnerships with government agencies or other uh, religious denominations or ecumenical or interfaith or public-private religious secular partnerships. Let me give you just one example, uh, going back to the aforementioned Steve Monsma. Steve did a really good study, uh, published a book called Putting Faith in Partnerships in 2004, at University of Michigan Press, where he looked at just one area of faith-based social service delivery, welfare to work. And he looked at Philly and Los Angeles and Chicago and New York, excuse me, and Dallas. And let me just, just quickly summarize his findings. First, the vast majority of these organizations are not faith-saturated or term he prefers to faith-saturated, faith-integrated. They receive beneficiaries without regard to religion, and they staff largely without regard to religion. Only 2.9% of them strictly hire only co-religionists, and only another 6.9% give even hiring preference to co-religionists. So that's kind of, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure that we all can make that sort of statement <laughs> ourselves if we're consulting our subconsciouses. Among those with government contracts, about 40% complained about paperwork. Hey, they're like everybody else. Uh, but none report that government uh, support or terms made them less effective, displaced private donations, or reduced volunteer manpower in favor of paid full-time staff. Instead, two-thirds reported that public funds permitted them to, surprise, surprise, expand their services to help more people in need. Gosh, what do you think you'd do if you've been doing this for 10, 15, or 20 years and you got more money? Keep on doing it, only with more money. Moreover, uh, and this is a calculation that you really should not read any comparative cost effectiveness into. These are just the facts, as it were, of what you can make of them, I'm not sure. But on average, the faith-based groups, the faith-based welfare-to-work programs, served about 200 clients a year on budgets averaging 90,000, containing almost no government money whereas the secular and professional uh, organizations on average served about 400 clients a year, but on budgets of 900,000 uh, a year, often containing large sums of government money. Moreover, the faith-based programs were more prolific in serving people who had no job history at all and figured disproportionately in serving the minority poor. Okay, so. Majority opinion, he says, and research, and court doctrine, and public administration, and the common cold, and everything lines up uh, on this side. So, so what's the problem? What happened? Well, I think Ben Franklin uh, would be happy 
with uh, the foregoing recitation. I also think he would have been uh, quite approving of the original plan uh, that uh, the president unveiled on January 29, 2001, the first day of his first full week in office and the day he began by signing the two executive orders uh, that created the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, uh, which I'll just refer to here after as the office or OFBCI, and also authorized the creation of five so-called office centers in five cabinet agencies with another executive order saying, uh, go and study these agencies, look at their grant making, come back in 180 days and report on what you find. How is, uh, how, what, is what does this process uh, 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 hold for smaller religious groups and other grassroots nonprofits? Uh, do they get treated, treated fairly? Are there special barriers to their participation? In his opening remarks at the signing ceremony, the president stressed, we will not fund religious activities of any group, but when people of faith provide services, we will not discriminate against them. Uh, the executive order creating the office read in part, the delivery of social services must be results oriented and value the bedrock principles of pluralism, non-discrimination, even handedness and neutrality. And the signing was prefaced by two announcements. The first announcement was the uh, nomination of Mayor Stephen Goldsmith, former Mayor Goldsmith, who had been Bush's chief domestic policy advisor during the 2000 campaign, former mayor of Indianapolis, to become the chairman of the Corporation for National Service. And the second announcement was that Italian Democrat professor from Philadelphia will be here to do the other job. And these were not coincidental. These were not merely coincidental. Goldsmith was to lead the administration's compassion agenda in his CNS or other future official capacities during the president's uh, first term. I was a longtime uh, Goldsmith uh, friend. And basically, our joint six-month plan called for the CNS, the Corporation for National Service, and the office to begin to work incrementally, Hale Boldovsky, <laughs> incrementally uh, toward three bipartisan objectives. First, study and implement existing charitable choice laws. Because in 2001, after four years on the books, I mean, they've been on the books for five, but effective for four, there was really very little evidence that it had made a difference. And so, you know, the number of work-based welfare uh, to work programs in Philly, to go just stick with Steve Monson's example, 40% of all organizations in Philly that provide that service are religious in character, and yet there hadn't been any increase that we could tell in the number that had applied even, or even had, knew what a notification of funding availability was, or gotten any technical assistance. So the first thing was uh, to complete that rev uh, aforementioned review, mandated by executive order, shed light on the extent to which the federal government itself posed barriers, and then try to think of a way around those barriers uh, so that these organizations had a fair shot, so we could, as it were, level the playing field. The second objective was funding vital religious secular public-private partnerships at scale. One of the great misconceptions then as now is that charitable choice was about new money. Charitable choice has nothing to do with money. Charitable choice only affects the public administration process. But there needed to be new money as well. And so there was a proposal for what was variously called a compassion capital fund or a civic capital fund or a civic uh, compassion fund to provide new federal matching funds and, you know, numbers like $8 billion, $8 billion were floated. That's, an, you know, not a bad number, for starters. Um, $8 billion to identify model public-private religious secular initiatives. And the one that got the most attention, and I'll come back to very quickly in closing, was sort of the model was a program that had begun in Philadelphia that I had a hand in that partnered Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, which is a national secular mentoring organization, with networks of local churches to mobilize mentors for the nearly two million kids in America who on any given day have a mom or a dad incarcerated. Now, this is a radically underserved population, lots of good research on it. The program had gotten off the ground in Philly. There was a record mentor mobilization, volunteer mobilization being the real comparative advantage of these faith-based organizations. And so you had this national religious, a national secular nonprofit brand name organization partnering all around the country with networks of local churches. Senator Clinton had been an early and enthusiastic supporter. President Bush uh, celebrated it uh, 
repeatedly, mentioned it repeatedly, came to Philadelphia on July 4th, 2001, had a block party, spending hours with the volunteers and the kids and, and whatnot. And the idea uh, of the Compassion Capital Fund initially was, well, get a program like that, figure what it needs to go to scale city by city, and the feds will put up their 50 cents, and the mayor will put up his quarter, and the private donors will put up their quarter, and this we can, you know, we can achieve. So there was to be new money, but that was the form the new money was to come in. And third and last but not least, uh, in addition to studying and implementing charitable choice and this sort of compassion capital fund idea, seating OFBCI counterparts in mayor's offices all across the country. There's no way, no way you can get anything like this done if you don't have real federal local cooperation. And it can't be hit or miss, and it can't be top down. And so what we did was we reached out to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The incoming president of the Conference of Mayors at that time was Mark Morial, who was then the mayor of New Orleans, and who was also a very good personal uh, friend of mine. And we encouraged the Mayor's Conference to endorse this plan, which it did in June 2001, enthusiastically in Detroit uh, at a conference where uh, President Bush uh, gave a speech. And the idea essentially was to create mayoral level local OFBCI counterpart offices dedicated to helping these small but qualified community serving organizations with help from organizations like AmeriCorps, with help from the Corporation for National Service providing technical assistance, and with some federal seed dollars as well. And again, the mayors uh, embraced this idea, uh, two thirds of them Democrats, uh, with both hands and both feet. Now, what you haven't heard me talk about in any of this was any part of this plan being a push for new legislation. Because there was no new legislation. There wasn't supposed to be, or there wasn't to be, any new legislation. Because no new legislation was needed. And not only was it not needed at the time, um, it was pretty obvious that diverse political pitfalls would plague any early push for new legislation on so-called faith-based. Temperatures were still running high over the Florida vote count controversy. Um, you know, you had a big tax bill and an education bill as the first 280-day priorities of the administration. You had a president whose approval ratings were likely to idle, you know, early on. CNS and AmeriCorps were despised uh, by key House Republican leaders. You're not going to want to push that button too hard. Uh, they called it a Clinton program uh, that used paid volunteers. And the office itself, uh, per executive order, couldn't even open until mid-February, uh, had just a couple people on staff, and would have to find a new director by or before Labor Day because I had publicly announced that I would do this for six months or until the report was finished, whichever came first. And uh, then the day we released the report at Brookings, I'm proud to say, I made my resignation public. <laughs> so there was a lot to be done in a short space of time and a lot of political pitfalls. Moreover, most journalists seemed almost completely unaware that there were existing charitable choice laws on the books, that those Clinton-Gore-era charitable choice laws were already there. And so if you go back and you replay, you rerun the tape, the run-up to January 29, 2001, the several weeks that follow, the White House is constantly trying to dampen any impression that there's going to be any new push for legislation, let alone any legislation that's going to challenge neutrality principles. Uh, the president makes a series of speeches, I won't quote them all here, but I mean he gives a series of speeches, a number of statements, uh, press releases, press conferences, the national prayer breakfast, he uses the national prayer breakfast to remind us that our, to remind everybody that our plan will not favor religious over non-religious institutions, I'm interested in what's constitutional, I'm interested in what works, on and on and on. The president's first nationally televised speech, right, his first one after uh, assuming the office, sitting in the gallery next to First Lady Laura Bush when the president spoke these words about faith-based was Philadelphia's Democratic mayor, John Street. Happened to be the second African-American uh, uh, to hold that office in Philly. And the message was that faith-based would stay above partisan politics and that any associated outreach to minority communities would transcend vote-seeking. The president even used the quip I wrote about how Street had helped, you know, Gore thrash Bush in Philadelphia. And so, you know, that was, that was the tone that was trying to be set. And the reality beneath it was that Bush 
like Street, really believed in getting government at all levels to help these communities serving religious organizations help the poor. That was the message and that was also the truth. But no sooner had the office opened its doors in mid-February than House Republican staff drafted and circulated a faith bill containing provisions that sparked really partisan warfare and challenged the neutrality principles respected by the charitable choice laws. I can be, go very quickly here toward the, my conclusion because there's a great book. Uh, there are many, in fact, there are about, I've counted about 20 books now that have been written uh, on this subject. And reading about yourself and such things is an out-of-body experience, which with a body like mine is a good experience to have. But um, the best of them, I think, is one called, uh, and not because I, believe me, emerge unscathed from many of them, but uh, a 2004 book called Of Little Faith, The Politics of George W. Bush's Faith-Based Initiative by a uh, young political scientist at Wheaton named Amy Black and her colleagues. And essentially, I, I think they get it right. I mean, when you're involved in it and immersed in it, nothing seems like it's, oh, I, that wasn't what I had for breakfast that day, you know, that sort of thing. But I think they come pretty close because essentially what she gets right is that you had a conflict at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue and within both parties between what she describes as religious pragmatists, welcome back Franklin, and, the, and what she calls the religious purists. And essentially the battle intra and intramural, intra and intra, intra and interparty, legislative executive, comes over, is over three issues which never quite ever entirely go away. One is in the bill that is proposed, which becomes H.R. 7, the Community Solutions Act, the first draft of this, a provision called Beliefs and Tenets, which essentially says you can proselytize. And in fact, you can proselytize with public funds, and there's not much of a problem with that. Secondly, you can hire only co-religionists. And third, you can summarily change how most federal programs are administered, namely, voucherize them. Okay? So, now, to me, at the time, as now, the first non-neutrality preference, as I call it, you know, the proselytizing was plainly unconstitutional, but also beside the point empirically, if you will, because most, again, actual community-serving ministries do not, even when they don't get public money, proselytize. The second non-neutrality preference, employment discrimination, also seemed needlessly controversial because, as I've already noted as well, federal law already permitted a limited ministerial exemption. Uh, and again, besides which, most urban community-serving religious organizations do not hire only co-religionists, again, even when they don't get public money. The third non-neutrality preference, vouchers, was just politically out to lunch. Uh, the education bill, the Bush education bill, had already removed vouchers. I mean, the vouchers were not going to be fought for in the education bill, so you think you're going to fight for them across the entire, you know, range of federal social program administration? Not likely. Not to mention constitutionally questionable. Vouchers are obviously easier constitutionally than direct grants, but it's not a, it's not a layup they don't automatically meet the true private choice standard that was articulated in Zellman and many uh, earlier decisions. Not only that, but the voucher preference seemed empirically challenged because vouchers supposedly were needed to support faith-saturated programs that had proven their success in solving social ills through spiritual transformation. And the single most widely invoked example was a program called Teen Challenge, which I happen to think highly of. And despite its name, it is a drug rehab or substance abuse rehab program that serves mainly adult males uh, who have substance abuse histories. Well-meaning boosters asserted that the program had extraordinary cure rates, 86%, 90%. But there were studies that said otherwise. There was a study by the Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse which you know, made mincemeat of that claim. Now, when you're in the White House and you testify in Congress or you go in public, you're not supposed to say things. You're not supposed to be a professor. But I said things like that, uh, especially in a March uh, 2001 speech I gave before the National Association of Evangelicals. Bad choice of venue, I concede, but there, but there it was. Uh, the data are the data, right? The data are the data. 
Uh, so there was and there remains no scientific reason to believe that faith-saturated programs succeed where either faith-based or secular programs falter or fail. Now, I'm going to skip over the rest of the history of what happens and just come, you know, and just come right to the present. The one of those three issues that remains most controversial over the next three to four years or the last three to four years is the hiring rights uh, provision. A bill emerges. I get Senator Lieberman and Senator Santorum to come into the Oval Office. We work on a, a, a clean bill. You know, the week after this House Resolution 7 is voted on, so it's almost a straight party line vote in the House. It's dead before arrival. Lieberman and Santorum come in. We were going to start a new bill. We work on it over the summer. It's essentially Charitable Choice 5, and it's in my breast pocket as I'm waiting for the President to come back to brief him on its progress on September the 11th, 2001. Uh, I'm sitting there waiting for him in the West Wing when the attacks occur. So obviously that briefing didn't happen. But then, over the ensuing five to six months, this bill was revived again. It appears as something called the CARE bill. And Democrats begin to say, OK, we felt alienated. We felt you know, you know, kicked to the curb and so forth. We felt it wasn't really bipartisan. The House Republicans really over-politicized this. We're not sure what was going on in the White House. There seemed to be a lot of different messages coming out of there, Giulio saying, you know, giving speeches at the Association of Evangelicals saying one thing, others saying other. So let's take another look. But what also happens then is the president signs another executive order, and that executive order goes to religious hiring rights. And although it has no practical effect, it has no practical effect, symbolically it says, ah, so you still want to fight about this. So Democrats' positions harden. And then some Democrats go to the extreme of saying, well, if that's how you want to play, let's strip the original or the existing ministerial exemption Let's get rid of the relevant language from the 64 you know, Civil Rights Act. So now you have the extremes, the, what I call the orthodox sectarians and the orthodox secularists, you know, the factions battling it out. And so nothing really uh, much happens. Um, just last month there was a conflict. The White House put out a report about how much money has gone to faith-based organizations, a, a report from SUNY Albany, Rockefeller Institute, uh, kind of, uh, had said the opposite just the month before, and round and around she goes. Where do we go from here? What would Franklin do? I think the first thing that Franklin would do was try to have not only wit, but humility, and also a sense of civic obligation about this. Right before Franklin died, another one of his... Uh, Another one of the final things that, that Franklin uh, penned before he said his farewell, he talked about how he had spent his life supporting all the various sects in Philadelphia and other places with his own money, you know, helped to build synagogues, helped to build mosques, helped to build churches, and also commented on how he had never, no matter how absurd was the word he used, he found the doctrines of other, you know, of other persons, uh, of, of other believers, he never challenged their doctrines. Never challenged their doctrines. And he said, I hope, you know, to sort of leave this world in peace with them all. I think the one thing, uh, uh, the overarching lesson from Franklin to learn is a lesson about how we conduct the discourse. And let me pluck the beam from my own eye. We're going to get to a Catholic examination of conscience directly. <laughs> um, I made a huge mistake in, I, don't, I wouldn't change a single position <laughs> that I took. So there's the stubborn South Philly guy for you. But I made a huge mistake in assuming that it was self-evident or would be self-evident to everyone. How dare anyone think that those three non-neutrality preferences deserved a second look? You know, I'm more than frustrated by this. I'm going to go and pound on the table, uh, upset my colleagues in the West Wing, to be sure, but also, you know, not really communicate because there are people, 42% of Americans who identify themselves as born-again Christians, 42% of adult Americans, and a majority, according to the surveys, and we have good survey data, think that this neutrality notion is Orwellian. They say to me, years after, as the dust settles, John, you're a good Catholic. You guys run schools, and you don't particularly care who's in your schools or whether they become Catholics. 
Well, that's a great point of pride. We Catholics will do things like that. But in their view, this neutrality doctrine is kind of like Blaine amendments were to Catholics. That's their view. You know, what you guys don't like about, you look back on the Blaine amendments, they were directed against you. This neutrality stuff is about us. It works for everybody else but us. I was not duly Franklinian in that regard. A second piece of Franklin to take, I think, uh, if, we're, if we want to move forward, is the practical Franklin, the applied Franklin, the stick to what works or figure it out. You don't have to discover electricity, but, you know, that Franklin. And here I think it, we've really lost our way. The aforementioned program of mentoring, the program mentioned, it has a name. It's called Amachi. Literally on the day the controversy, the most recent controversy over the numbers the White House report broke, there was an event in Texas, got no press, hardly, where the Republican governor of Texas, Rick Perry, had the, another former Philadelphia mayor, Wilson Good, who was the first African-American mayor of Philly, who runs the Amachi program, this national religious secular mentoring program uh, for prisoners' children. And Perry was announcing his support in Texas uh, of Amachi. Now that program is the only program out of, the, out of all this uh, debate and argument to have actually received additional dollars, 150 million new federal dollars to support the so-called MCP, Mentoring Children of Prisoners program. That program established a goal of 100,000 mentors in four years. And as of January, it only had gotten to 14,000. And it was put on the White House's results not demonstrated list following the, two, the release of the 2007 budget. If you look at the actual numbers and you do the sort of good Franklinian pragmatic practical policy analysis, you find that 66 of the top 100 grantees were the Amachi grantees. The very program the President and Senator Clinton had, had touted turns out to be the program that's working the best. And had all the 231 grantees performed even near that average, they'd have been well on track, on a glide path to their 100,000 goals. So there has to be a little bit of concern, I think, for uh, the, practical, you know, the practical mechanics, if you will, uh, of what will make, uh, make things work and what will get this help to people in need. Finally, I think you know, one, one can get lost in the national politics of this because it is the fun part, if you will. I guess we call this fun. But if you look at Franklin's career, in particular with respect to religion, which he knew was going to be a tricky issue for Americans in the out centuries, as it were. Um, Franklin was very, very careful to advise us never to go to bed angry <laughs> about religion. It's a bad thing to go to bed angry about. You can go to bed angry about lots of other things as a polity, but not about religion. And so figuring out ways of, even if you have the disagreement, figuring out ways of engaging the dialogue. And frankly, that is the thing that absolutely has not happened over the last four or five years. More important to me than how much money has gone out, more important to me than the practical bipartisan national political dynamics is the fact that the kind of dialogues that were happening before the initiative got started seem to have been chilled uh, by the adversarial politics of the issue. And in, in various... Uh, things that Franklin said, thought, and did in his career, I think we can find clues about the way back. Well, let me, I've gone farther than I should, talked longer than I should. Let me turn off my motor and uh, take any questions or comments or uh, swipes at Franklin that you might want to make. And I thank you for your, your patience.